Welcome to the Black Spray Hood. Today our guest is somebody who's been crucial to us in our sailing journey. We consider him our sailing mentor and a model of how we will aspire to be on the boat, although we're not quite there yet. Please welcome Peter Derbyshire. Hi. Um, well, look, you're very kind. I didn't think, I didn't think, I think you're overstating the, the role I played, but uh, it's very flattering. Thank you. So we, um, we met Peter on a website called Crew Seekers, which matches up people who want sailing experience but don't have a boat. That was us at the time. And people that have a boat and would like some crew, and that, that was Peter. And we went sailing with Peter on many weekends, and he had to be very patient with us. Yeah, uh, it was... No, the crew seekers actually, I think it's a great thing because if you have a boat and if, like me, you tend, you got a boat which you bought because you knew you'd be sailing solo most of the time, it's really, really nice to have enthusiastic sailors or potential sailors on board um, and to watch them progress. And I think the, the approach I'd always take was to sit back and enjoy it and let everyone get on with it. And uh, if they make mistakes, that's fine. That's what we all did when we were learning. And there we are, that was, that's the basic philosophy. So uh, Peter, can you tell us what you love about sailing and uh, how did you get into it? Uh, yes, uh, it was, I suppose, uh, I've always loved being on the water. I've had a, <coughs> a series of day boats over the years. When my two boys, Freddie and Charlie were younger, uh, I had a Draskam lugger and uh, we had some interesting moments then. Uh, I kept it on a mooring on the River Arm down in Devon, and I had a few friends, and this was before Charlie and Freddie were born, but there was a, a very famous uh, fast net race when a lot of boats were sunk. Now, my friend Tass and I had, uh, had a very merry, cheerful evening the night before, you might say, and when we woke up in the morning, we thought, what we need is a sail to clear our heads. And so without actually checking the weather, uh, which in those days was perhaps harder. But anyway, we just whizzed down, hopped in the boat, uh, throbbing heads, and headed down to the estuary, which was relatively sheltered. We were absolutely stunned to find the aftermath of the storm, which had sunk all the fast net boats. Um, <laughs> we, it's a very, very good way of sobering up and um, learning quickly. But what happened was with Draston Lugger, the waves were breaking over the bar across the, the mouth of the River Erm, a bit like the entrance to a number of Devon harbours, uh, river estuaries. And we realised that actually every wave that went through uncovered the sandbar as a wave built and you can then suddenly see the sand. So we, we had to pick a wave that would surface over the sandbar. Um, that was interesting. But we got there and we didn't, we didn't lose the boat. So that was one of my early experiences. Then uh, I had um, what's it, Cornish Crabber, a little 17, Cornish Crabber 17, which uh, was great with Freddie and Charlie. I kept it on a, in a marina in Edinburgh. But my most memorable sailing was in Scotland when we had a boys' week every year on the West Coast and we'd charter a boat. Um, and my role was always quite clear because I didn't get seasick, I'm really lucky. So I was always in charge of food and drink. Um, probably with emphasis on the drink, and that being Scotland. Why is that not a surprise? Um, yeah, well, I guess you probably know this is a theme that goes through all this. Um, given, given my background in the drinks industry, it was possibly not surprising. But we had some memorable times going to Fingal's Cave in the, in the Robert Inkey with the, the music, Mendelssohn's music, blaring on a, a boombox that we had in those days. That was pretty memorable. Uh, on the island of Mull. And the skipper, who's a very highly qualified yacht master, but with a, with a wild streak. He had this brilliant idea the night before that we'd swim round to all the boats around us in the, in, in the anchorage, uh, clutching a bottle of gin and a few tonics, but not many, and invite ourselves on board and have a, a number of parties. And everyone was incredibly 
receptive. Uh, but the end result was that we, again, wound up with pretty bad hangovers the next morning. But what we need is a sail to clear our heads. Maybe you can see a theme coming through here. It's a, it's a very good way of clearing your head. <laughs> and so we upped anchor, measuring out to Tobermory, and all these boats were coming in. And the crews were waving at us, we thought. Uh, it transpired. They weren't perhaps waving so much as uh, telling us, no, 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 don't go out. And when we got out there, we kind of realised why. It was, it was blowing up sort of 10, force 10, gusting 11. And on the wall behind me, my vanity wall, there's a picture of a boat, which is almost horizontal. And uh, the mast is probably at 30 degrees to the water. And this is on a 46 footer. Uh, and that was just with a storm sail up. And there's one of the other crew there leaning very casually against the mast, you know, looking totally relaxed. Um, so that was another, another interesting episode with Patrick. Lots more like that. But anyway, I'm now a very responsible skipper sometimes. Yeah. That, anyway, that, that's what got me into sailing. It's just this, this love of being on the water. Uh, and it's for me, it's the last place in the world where you are entirely in charge of your own life. And that's, that's a big attraction. There's no one to tell you what to do, when to do it, how to do it. You have a boat, there's the sea, and out you go. Wow. Yeah. So Peter, what do you think are the most important skills or personal attributes for sailing? Um, I think the great rule of sailing is that you will break long before the boat does. And so if you, if you remember that, when things get a little bit hairy and bring the boat down from Scotland, they bought her in Scotland six years ago now, and sailing down the Irish Sea, we encountered one or two little issues. And the, the usual thing to do is panic. And then you get on the radio and it's mayday, 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 or whatever, pan, pan, pan. But no, because you don't, the boat will survive. You just need to work out how to survive comfortably while letting the boat do all the hard work. That's the biggest rule of all. And apart from that, uh, it's kind of enjoying. Wow, and, what, and what's um, been some of your favorite sailing experiences? Um, I think you told me once you caught the eye of a certain dolphin in Pool Harbor once. Ah, oh, yes. The, um, yeah, and luckily I have a photo, so I can prove this really, really happened. Uh, I was, there's an anchorage, Goatland Point in Pool Harbour, which is one of my favourites. I thought we did it together. And Luciano's eagle eye spotted something in the distance approaching, which I missed entirely. Um, are we allowed to talk about uh, paddle borders? <laughs> <laughs> of course. Yeah. Uh, but there is Luciano who spotted her, not me, but uh, <laughs> a, a very attractive young lady, a very blonde young lady, uh, was paddleboarding in Pool Harbour. And as she got closer and closer, and me not having noticed her in any way or shape or form. Of course not. <laughs> of course not. Um, it suddenly dawned on us that actually she's wearing no clothes. And she's paddleboarding away. And when Luciano pointed this out, I, of course, had to just check his story. And he was <laughs> so relaxed. Uh, we missed our chance. He should have said, come on, come on, come on, can I have a gin and tonic, whatever on board. But anyway, we missed that chance. And then she just lay down on the paddleboard, it was a lovely sunny day, and drifted for God knows how long, um, having a nice sunbathe, and that was it. But that was the paddleboard. The other story from Pool Harbor was the, the dolphin. And I was anchored on my own, on the boat and it was kind of evening, early evening. It was a really Greek day, to use a lovely Scottish word, or Greek evening even. And I was down below, was making some supper, and there's a tapping on the outside of the hull. And I thought, it's funny, I'm, I'm the only boat here, or at least when I went down below, I was the only boat there. I thought maybe someone's arrived, maybe there's someone on the dinghy coming to ask uh, if they can borrow a bottle of gin or something. Um, but I popped up on deck and there was a dolphin 
and it was the dolphin that had tapped on the hull. So I went to the bow, and this is where I had my phone camera with me, so I managed to take a few photos of the dolphin with its head out of the water looking up at me between the anchor chain and the bow. So it was obviously just holding itself there. So we chatted for a while, and then he wandered off, and that was fine. I thought, well, that's, that was a fairly amazing experience. Um, and then maybe 10 minutes later, he came back and did a, a fly pass down the starboard side, stern to bow. But he did it on his back. And what you really couldn't miss was the fact that he had a very large erection. <laughs> so my first thought was, there's no chance of you getting in that water right now. Um, that would be tempting fate. Um, but anyway, so off he went and all of this and that bubble. Uh, that was strange. Uh, then another five, ten minutes later, he came back, and this time he had um, a large mackerel in his mouth. Oh. Dropped in the water beside me, on the starboard side still, oh, again, and looked at me. And I said, well, yeah, I think I'm, I think I get what you're you're sort of hinting at here. And no, I'm not jumping in the water. <clears throat> so <laughs> that was. That was what I thought, the end of it. Um, and so I went down, had myself, I went to, went to bed. Um, and then just before five in the morning, it was tap, tap, tap on the hull again. And it was the dolphin back again. So I got up, made a cup of coffee, we chatted. Uh, I sat in the bar and he sort of looked at me and I looked at him. And both of us thinking the same thing. I wonder what he's saying. Um, then up anchor and away. So there we are, my amorous dolphin story, which I can prove. So Peter, you haven't just taught us about sailing, but you've also taught us so much about the personal qualities that are important for sailing. Uh, we did meet another skipper on Cruise Seekers and we had completely the opposite experience. He was really rude impatient and you're so calm so patient every time we went out on your boat we seemed to forget what we'd learned the time before and you never ever seemed to mind you just made it such an enjoyable and relaxing experience so how did you learn how to be so zen to be honest i think it i think it's probably innate but i you, you didn't know it. it's, it's on those things but i did learn in management my background was managing drinks companies and you learned very quickly, there's absolutely no point in shouting at someone. There's absolutely no point in losing your temper. There's absolutely no point in trying to tell people what to do. The, the secret to management, to my mind, is always that you want to make sure that what you would like the person to do becomes their idea. So you don't tell, always ask and say, what would you do? And you say, well, and then it says, brilliant. Now, uh, how about if we just add this little bit here on and, and then suddenly it's their project, they're away. I think it's the same thing with sailing. You, you don't tell people what to do. You say, yeah, just, just do it. And, um, there's not that much that can go wrong. The, the other sort of philosophy in life is it's always been that you should do things that possibly frighten you. For me, it's, for me, it's always been you should, I'm much more afraid of being afraid than I am frightened of things that might frighten me, if that makes sense. And so you push yourself to do things you know, the first time you go out in a, a force eight on your own, the first time you do go out in the aftermath of a storm and it's 24 roads, the first time you do those things. And then you suddenly realize, yeah, the, boat's, the boat can cope. It doesn't matter what I do, the boat can cope. Peter. Has anything eventful happened to you that you could tell us? And because uh, I remember you saying that you you were shot at at the course of your whiskey dealings. But so I had this ambition to travel, and then I joined the whiskey company, and they said, "You we're looking for an export, an area director um, for Africa and the Middle East." So, maybe with your background, and um, sounds like you might fit the bill. And the wonderful thing about those days is it was pre-mobile phones, is pre-telephones working with any reliability, even mainline ones. Um, and so I found myself going to, to Africa and the Middle East 
was a lot of time traveling because you sometimes go off on a six week trip. And he went to, I think it's, I think there's only three countries in Africa I haven't been to. And Africa then was a different sort of different kettle of fish. There were a lot of wars going on, a lot of, um, it was where capitalism was beating communism and there were proxy wars in quite a few countries. But the thing about wars is that people drink war. So if you go there, um, if you go into the war zones, then uh, you can do some really good business. So that was my that was my thing. But the one or two little drawbacks, because if you go into a war zone, uh, there are people with guns, and sometimes people with guns try and shoot at you, or uh, bombs. I was in Israel one time with my local distributor, and we wanted to change my airline ticket. And in those days, you had to go to the travel agency. And we were on our way on foot to the travel agency. We met a friend of Itzig's. His name was Isaac, but he's always known as Itzig. And so we were chatting. And at the time we were meant to be in the travel agency, uh, or at the travel agency, uh, a bomb blew up. So that was reasonably close. The other one was um, in Namibia. This was the days when the Swapo guerrillas were fighting the South African um, regular army, if you want. Uh, but there was then the apartheid army rather than the modern army. And so the guerrilla activity meant that there were bombings, uh, there were shootings, and different things. And you never quite knew where, but uh, a lot of good business must be had if you went to where the diamond mining camps and things were. There's a lot of people there with nothing much to do after work except to sit down with a, a nice glass of whiskey. So um, that was one of the things, but slightly sort of disconcerting part of it was that when I got in the car that morning to drive to one of these camps, um, the guy who was taking me, lovely guy, the local salesman, gave me a pistol. That's why well, this is fairly unusual. Um, and the the pistol was, he said, was because there's been some spark of guerrilla activity in the area, roads might be mined, keep an eye open for this and that. Um, and he said, well, and if, if we are attacked, um, don't bother shooting at them, at them, shoot yourself. Now that was that, uh, what else? Um, uh, arrested, spying. That was quite interesting. Um, in those days, the problem was that you uh, needed different passports for different countries and areas. You needed a passport for South Africa because the South African visa stamp would have invalidated your passport for other African countries. Uh, you needed a passport to go to Israel because an Israeli stamp in your passport would have precluded going to any of the other Arab countries in the area. So it so happened this was a long trip and I was going to Israel, I was going to South Africa, and I was going to African countries. I was probably going to Jordan as well, I can't remember anymore. Um, so fine, I, 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 I went down to the port in Togo and, and the port in Togo was one of the main conduits for smuggling uh, alcohol, cigarettes, all kinds of things into the Nigerian Delta, uh, where all the oil installations are. And they had these giant pirogues with a bank with six big outboards on the back. And those pirogues would be laden or loaded up with cases of booze, cigarettes, whatever. And obviously it was illegal i so say they were quite touchy about people going down there. But there's a, a policeman, obviously, on watch, on guard. And so he reached a little agreement because I would be able to look and take a few photos. But then his boss arrived. And so uh, our agreement was um, very quickly forgotten. And the boss said, uh, what are you doing? And I said, well, just having a look and took a photo or two and you know, your colleague here. Uh, anyway, um, cutting a long story short, I was arrested for spying. Mm -hmm. And luckily for me, the police car uh, that would, would have taken me back to the station had broken down. 
He said, I had to hire a taxi to take me and the policeman's superior officer back to the police station to be properly arrested and charged and to have the negotiation about what my release fee might be. The only problem was is that I knew the release fee could be negotiated. Um, and we were always paying on the cash, inevitably. But if they found three different passports in my briefcase, then that would have changed the tone completely, and I really would have been had up on spying charges. So when we got to the police station, I said to the taxi driver, I'm sure I can sort this out. No, you just wait here for me. And so I had my wallet, but I left my briefcase with the passports in the taxi, thinking, well, even if he drives away, I really don't care. I absolutely didn't want to be found with three passports. So we went in, um, we had the negotiation, and I was fined hundred dollars, I think, something like that. Um, obviously payable in kind. And so I wanted that. And uh, the taxi was still there. So I think like whiskey's got you into quite a lot of escapades. And I believe when you were younger, you were involved in a windsurfing based promotion for J&B oh. Whiskey. Can you tell us about that? Yes, yes. I'm, you know, I probably bored with those stories, but I don't know if you can see in the background behind my head, there's uh, a picture of a windsurfer with three sails. Can you see that? Yes. Behind me. Uh, that's the J&B Triple. And the whiskey company I was working for was, was J&B Rare Whiskey. And a really good university friend of mine, uh, Steve, um, became a marine biologist and he was heading up the IMER lab in Plymouth. Ultimately, not, I didn't think he was heading it up at that point. But for some reason, he decided that windsurfing was the thing. And so he bought one of the very first windsurfers in the UK before gold with a wooden boom and all kinds of things which nowadays. Um, and then I've no idea why he decided that he, should, he would buy uh, this very large tandem, very long is a, a panther, a sea panther, I think it was called, and it was in two pieces which he slotted together and bolted together, so you had the two sails. Then he, he worked it out, actually you could fit a third sail in the middle and so I think we had the first ever triple windsurf in the UK. And so we, we were sort of pottering around and then the J&B, uh, I said, so look, we, we need some money to buy kit and stuff. And would you sponsor us? And so they agreed to give us a certain amount of money for every minute of television coverage that mm -hmm. we could get. And you can see the picture behind me, it's quite strong branding. And because it was a triple, whatever event we went to, the cameras always followed the triple. And then we wound up eventually upgrading that triple to some rather some better designed ones. And we started doing speed weeks. And so we went to Weymouth, to Puerto to uh, Porta Louis in France. And Weymouth and Puerto Ventura were the, the fastest ones. And of course, there were people who were infinitely better than us. We were at rank amateurs. But when you had the triple going full chat down the time course, it did look pretty spectacular. Peter, is it okay if we ask you some questions about your dad? Ah, um, after the war, he was recruited by MI6. And the, the problem was that um, in 1952, there's an election in Iran, and Dr. Mossadegh was elected as prime minister. And the Shah was expelled. Uh, the Americans and the British were working together on this. And the Dr. Mossadegh was inclined towards the Russians because they share a, a common border in the two countries. And there's a very real possibility that Persia, as it was, would be drawn into the Russian sphere of influence. And this is the, the height of the Cold War, don't forget. Now you had East versus West. And it was really serious. It wasn't that long afterwards that you nearly had a, a nuclear war. You know. 
uh, over Cuba. Uh, and you know, Kennedy and all the others had their fingers on the button. So you have to think of that as the context. So the idea that Persia uh, and Dr. Mosseda nationalized the uh, Iranian, what is now the Iranian oil company, and uh, and now without compensation, which is standard, but if that had fallen under the control of the Russians, then there would have been a serious strategic issue for the West. So the, uh, the Americans um, put together a coup which didn't work. And then the Brits had to go, and that was headed up and led by my father. Now, uh, if people don't don't believe that, there is now a documentary which was made uh, very recently, came out last year or the year before, called Coup 53. Um, and you know, my, my father features very heavily. Um, Ralph Fiennes plays the part of my father uh, in an interview which he gave at the time, well, no, it was long after the time, um, just setting out why. And you know, people now would now say, that's morally actually corrupt and uh, it should never happen and uh, how dare you and how dare they. But in the context of the time, uh, it was a very necessary decision. And look at Iran now, it's the, the Ayatollahs and the trouble that they are sowing all over the Middle East. And uh, they are exporting terrorism, it's the funding terrorism, there's no, there's no doubt about that. Um, and there we are, that was, that was why that was done then, but it just so happened that my father was, I uh, headed up the, uh, the successful coup, if you want, which um, led to the reinstatement of the Shah of Iran and the um, house arrest of Dr. Mossad. It was, it was quite strange when, when you told us that your father was in MI6 because we were convinced that you were a spy, <laughs> you know, because you were involved in all these adrenaline sports like windsurfing and you had a motorbike, you know, you seem to have been in so many escapades in obscure parts of the world, being shot at. When you said that your father was in MI6, that was, yeah, that was kind of not surprising in a way. Um, do you, do you think that you take after him in some ways? Um, no, I don't think so, because he said um, the the days uh, during the war and after the war and SOE and MI6 were, had a lot of freedom to operate. They, had a lot, they were given initiative, they were allowed initiative, and they were encouraged to have initiative to do, achieve the objectives that needed achieving. And by the time I left uni, communication was such that everything was always referred back to head office. And that didn't appeal to me at all. The whole point of going to Africa and Middle East was that I was out of range of head office and literally had a free hand because I had a wonderful boss who was chairman of Grand Max in those days, Grand Max Bolton, Max and Joseph, Sir Max and Joseph. And essentially his instruction at the beginning of the year was, okay boys, go out there, bring back the money, or don't come back. And what, what was it like growing up as the son of a spy? I mean, how much were you aware of what was happening? How much did it affect your life? No, no awareness. It was no, the official secrets that meant that you, you weren't aware. Uh, you became aware. You know, I told posted to Beirut. Um, we, we did Cyprus, Bahrain, Iran. I was born in Iran, and then we went back to Iran. Um, in the 60s, um, and then uh, we had Beirut, which was a uh, four year posting. And it was there that there was an article published in the press identifying him and what he did. So he had to leave the country in a hurry. But before that, they realized that there was something a bit different because um, it was unusual to have a a gun clipped under the seat of the front seat of the car and things. And when you reach the age of 15, you're probably going to find that kind of thing. And so you needed to be told why it was there and don't touch. So age 15-ish, we, I mean, we got 
this is the story. Mm -hmm. So Peter, what are your memories of Iran? It's actually a truly beautiful country. Uh, and it's such a shame that it's closed to the most, most potential visitors. But it's also, there are also very beautiful people. And uh, there, is, there are, they're essentially an Aryan race. And you have this beautiful people living in a beautiful country with incredible history. You know, the history goes back two and a half thousand years and some various and all the other great emperors that you want who conquered the world except these, uh, they were fighting the Greeks for supremacy. And um, I think it's a shame that more people in this world don't see the glories of Isfahan, of Tabriz, of Mashhad and all the other beautiful cities there. If you look, if you look them up online, you see these incredible mosques with tile work, which is just breathtaking. Peter, I have to be honest, when I watched the documentary Q53, I had mixed feelings. First, I was impressed that your father was such a key character. The whole film seems to be about him. Spoiler alert. At some point in the film, it was quickly showing some of the world leaders and governments that suffered Q, uh, I guess, suggesting that UK and America have financed dictatorships around the world. I saw the name of the Brazilian president, João Goulart, uh, who was removed from power in the queue of 64. I was born in Brazil during the dictatorship, and I was very young when the country became democratic again. You might have heard a few things about Brazil recently and who the Brazilian president is. The president is very open about his nostalgia and admiration of the period of dictatorship. And some of his followers argue that that was a good time. They argue that democracy has failed in Brazil and is the reason why Brazil corruption is out of control. For me, especially watching this documentary about Iran, it made clear that radical ideology and creed is what drove these campaigns of dictatorship around the world. I can't talk about these other countries, but I believe that for Brazil, the Q has sparked like a culture of creed and corruption. Anyway, my question is, knowing your father better than anyone else, do you think that if he was still alive, he will seek credit and feel nostalgic about the Q of 53, or he will be open-minded to engage in the discussion and the dedication of the new generations? Um, um, interesting question. Um, I think context is everything. Uh, when, when I started talking about Iran, I was talking about the, the war between the East and the West. And it was, if you hadn't, if you didn't live through those times when uh, literally people were expecting a nuclear war to happen at any moment, it was, it was that bad. And I think people have forgotten that. It was, it was genuinely on the brink. Uh, if Khrushchev hadn't whispered all the missiles from Cuba, then there was every, every chance that it would have gone nuclear. So against that background, um, you, don't, you don't have the same morality that you want, and you don't have the same communication. So I think what's happened is that because people now have so many sources of information, um, and because the, the media which they read are essentially left-leaning. Um, if, you know, if you look at the press in the UK, BBC, a lot of the national press, same thing I think in the world. It's, um, there's this horrible it's a tendency to shut down debate and the woke generation who know the right and that there's no other point of view possible. Um, it's a great shame. In those days it was, it was much more black and white uh, in terms of not, not in racial terms, hastens to add, but it was just a very simple choice between democracy and totalitarianism. Don't forget, um, Stalin and Mao Zedong picked up where Hitler left off. Mao Zedong was probably the most prolific uh, killer in history. Uh, like he managed to outdo even the killer of the Hun. I don't know how many tens of millions of people he killed, but a vast number. Stalin with the Gulag um, and the total repression of the, the communist countries, uh, the whole of Eastern Europe, 
Um, there were many, many tens of millions who were killed in, in those camps. That was the background that you must remember. Then try and apply a modern morality to events then, because you were fighting something so very different. Does that make sense to you? Yeah, yeah, definitely. And, and by the way, uh, one thing you mentioned about Brazil, uh, it wouldn't surprise me if um, American other countries who had an interest in seeing the country uh, not turn communist, uh, would they have mounted things? Yep, um, like America has a history of intervening uh, in disputes in different parts of the world. But to my mind, usually for a good reason, but the intervention was quite often fairly inept. At the end of each episode, we, we ask a silly question to our guests. Uh, for you, we have prepared two special ones. So the first question is, if you were a cat, how many lives do you still have available? Uh, I think everything is calculated. Now you can take a risk, an apparent risk, but you've actually worked out the, what, the, what the real risk is. And so I can't really claim to put any lives at risk. Uh, you only find out once. And so that's one life gone, and that's your life gone. So <laughs> end of story. So, uh, the second question is like, let's pretend that MI6 has recruited you and you can't refuse the mission, but you can choose between three options. Like number one, a work shift from 9 a.m. to 6 p.m., working from home, spying on people on Facebook. And then number two, selling no alcoholic vodka and whiskey to Vladimir Putin and convince him that he, he will be drunk but hungover free. Or number three, paragliding at Buckham Palace to save the Queen from a paparazzi drone. Um, well, Putin doesn't drink, and so that's a, that's a really tough sell. It's always impossible to answer those questions because when you're faced with a situation, you assess it and then make a very quick decision. Like, all I would say is that if I was faced with a situation, one thing I do know about myself is that I make a decision, right or wrong, very quickly. Um, but certainly, uh, the, the Queen would be quite safe. I would never, uh, I, I think she's the most wonderful lady. She's done a huge amount of um, Great Britain, whatever. Thank you very much, Peter. Thank you so much for being on our show, Peter. Well, I'm, um, well, there's where it'll go, but no, it's, been, it's, been, it's been great having you on board Oran Namara, my boat, no, Oran Namara. For uh, anyone who ever listens to this, is the Gaelic for uh, Song of the Sea. And it's been, no, it's been a lovely experience for me. So thank you to Newlywed. Thanks for making it all the way to the end. If you'd like to find out more about our sailing adventures, please find out on theblackspreyhood.com.